Today we are going to talk about a very serious issue. And uh, it took me a long time to come to the point where I thought, perhaps it is time that we spoke about some of the things that we will be speaking about. Before we start, let us just bow our heads in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are living in such momentous times. And people are concerned and want to know what saith the Lord. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us through this lecture, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, and that we will come to conclusions which are biblical and based upon your word and upon the leading of your spirit. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this lecture is, Is This the End? And I was interested to see that the Express, the home of the Daily and Sunday Express, asked that same question, end of the world, is coronavirus the prophesied plague in the book of Revelation? And then uh, they state in this article, the end of the world will be preceded by widespread pestilence and plague. Militant Christians reading the Bible's book of Revelation have claimed. Could this plague from the Bible be the coronavirus epidemic sweeping around the globe? And then finally, after writing about these issues, they come to the conclusion there is, however, nothing to suggest the coronavirus is biblical in nature and not simply a manageable epidemic. Now, I tend to agree with them. On the other hand, we are told to look for the signs of the times. And people have been asking, is this the end? Is this the beginning of the end? And uh, what are the signs of the end? And is there any indication about how long the world will still continue? And we need to talk about some of these issues. And I think we're going to stick our necks out a little bit. But uh, let's see where this leads us. The first question I would like to address is, should we be studying the signs of the times? Now, I'll be using quite a few quotes from the spirit of prophecy. And I believe that this church has been blessed with this special gift to steer it through the times that we are living in. The spirit of prophecy is not to supersede the Bible. The spirit of prophecy is to make that which is sometimes a little bit obscure in the Bible very plain. And it leads us back to the greater light, which is the Word of God. So we need to base what we believe on the Word of God. But if God has seen fit to give us the special gift, we can also consult it. She writes, our ministers are not doing their whole duty. The attention of the people should be called to the momentous event which is so near at hand. She's talking about the coming of Christ. The signs of the times should be kept fresh before their minds. The prophetic visions of Daniel and John foretell a period of moral darkness and declension. But at the time of the end, the time in which we are now living, the vision was to speak and not lie. When the signs predicted begin to come to pass, the waiting, watching ones are bidden to look up and lift up their heads and rejoice because their redemption draweth nigh. So rather than a message of doom and gloom, there is a message of rejoicing and looking up. And we are to study the signs of the times and we are supposed to make them prominent. That means we must be in tune with what is happening in the world. Now many believe that when you do these things and you correlate the signs of the times with the Bible, that you are busy with conspiracy theories. Nothing could be further from the truth. We need to know where we stand in the stream of time. In the visions of the night, a very impressive scene passed before me. 
I saw an immense ball of fire fall amongst some beautiful mansions causing their instant destruction. I heard someone say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we did not know that they would come so soon. Others with agonized voices said, you knew. Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side I heard similar words of reproach spoken. If we do not speak, when we have knowledge that very few people have, then God will hold us accountable. When it came to the first coming of Christ, she writes in the book The Great Controversy, which by the way everybody should read if they can get hold of it. It was not the scholarly theologians who had an understanding of this truth and engaged in its proclamation, referring to the first coming of Christ. Had these been faithful watchmen, diligently and prayerfully searching the scriptures, they would have known the time of night. The prophecies would have opened to them the events about to take place, but they did not occupy this position and the message was given by humbler men. Jesus said, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. John 12, 35, those who turn away from the light which God has given or who neglect to seek it when it is within their reach are left in darkness. But the Savior declares, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8, 12. Whoever is with singleness of purpose seeking to do God's will, earnestly heeding the light already given, will receive greater light. To that soul some star of heavenly radiance will be sent to guide him into all truth. God wants us to know this is not a cosmic secret. God wants it proclaimed that the coming of Christ is near. It was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the close of probation. Now we're moving to the end of time. The prophet of God declares, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Who shall stand when he appeareth? Who is of purer eyes than to behold evil? and cannot look on iniquity? Joel 2.11, Habakkuk 1.13, To them that cry, My God, we know thee, yet have transgressed his covenant and hastened after another God, hiding iniquity in their hearts and loving the paths of unrighteousness. To these the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Even very dark and no brightness in it. Hosea 8.2 and then Psalm 16, 4 and Amos 5, 20. It shall come to pass at that time, says the Lord, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees. That say in the heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1, 12. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible, Isaiah 13, 11. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Your riches will not be able to spare you from this time of trouble that is upon us. Their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation, Zephaniah 1, 18 and 13. We need to understand the times we are living in. They are very serious. And God is seeking for a people that will be prepared to live according to his covenant. Now, many people are saying, do not make it so prominent. Be careful how you say these things. There's no need of milk of the souls have been convinced of the truth. As soon as the conviction of truth is yielded to and the heart willing, the truth should have its effect. The truth will work like leaven and purify and purge away the passions of the natural heart. It is a disgrace for those who have been in the truth for years 
to talk of feeding souls who have been months in the truth about upon milk. It shows they know little of the leading of the Spirit of the Lord and realize not the time we are living in. Those who embrace the truth now will have to step fast. There will have to be a breaking up of the heart before the Lord, a rending of the heart and not the garments. A reference to the Jewish custom of rending one's garments as a sign of great grief. We need to speak the truth unadulterated. People need to know where we stand in the stream of time. Because God's Spirit is gradually being withdrawn from this world. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are pretentious. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Testimonies, volume 9, page 11. Now, these things are unfolding before our eyes. We need to be aware of where we stand in the stream of time. People are saying, surely this will all go away. And then we'll have a time of peace and things will go back to normal. We need not get up into a state of excitement at this stage. The spirit of anarchy is permeating all nations. That's an important point. And the outbreaks that from time to time excite the horror of the world are but indications of the pent-up fires of passion and lawlessness that having once escaped control, will fill the earth with woe and desolation. The picture which inspiration has given of the antediluvian world represents too truly the condition to which modern society is fast hastening. Even now, in the present century, and in professedly Christian lands, there are crimes daily perpetrated as black and terrible as those for which the old world sinners were destroyed. Before the flood, God sent Noah to warn the world that the people might be led to repentance and thus escape the threatened destruction. As the time of Christ's second appearing draws near, the Lord sends his servants with a warning to the world to prepare for that great event. Multitudes have been living in transgression of God's law. And now he in mercy calls them to obey its sacred precepts. All who will put away their sins by repentance towards God and faith in Christ are offered pardon. This world is so steeped in iniquity. We hear little pieces here and we hear little pieces there and the world is appalled. This view was given in 1847 when there were but few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath, and of these but few supposed that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned, and this is important, does not refer to the time when the plagues shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. In a previous discussion on WhatsApp, Prof, I made the statement that we are 
possibly in the little time of trouble. In other words, this short period of time before the plagues will be poured out. Is that a possibility or is that fear-mongering? Let us carefully study and find out where we are in the stream of time. Here is a German news, uh, Metropole News, which says that millions of pictures and videos of sex traffic with little children have come to the fore. And there was an operation called Operation Gargamel, which is beginning, which is showing that the world is so steeped with iniquity that any sensible person would become appalled. Trafficking little children. Pizza gate. If we study the iniquity that goes on, even in the most highest ranks of society, then we are appalled. It is time for God to act and he will not much longer tolerate this kind of activity in the world. The world is evil beyond measure. Things like cannibalism, blood sacrifices, the drinking of blood of juveniles for rejuvenation, these are common things in the news today. And humanity is appalled. We are living in the times that it was in the days of Noah. And if anything, we are probably worse at this stage. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, pestilence were abroad in the land. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me and again everything was in utmost confusion. So it is quite possible that the events unfolding at the moment might again recede and we'll have an apparent moment of quiet and peace. At least I hope so, so that the gospel can do its work. But then my attention was called upon the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. And then once more the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me and again everything was in utmost confusion. Strife, war, bloodshed with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. War caused famine, Want and bloodshed caused pestilence, and then men's hearts failed them for fear and for looking upon those things which are coming upon the earth. So we have the beginnings, we have a little moment of peace, and then we have an escalation which will finally lead to the final events. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves, what are the signs we should be looking for? This is important. Well, both Jesus and Daniel refer to the abomination which causes desolation as one of the great signs. God's people in the time of Jesus were to look out for the abomination that causes desolation. And this was a dual application prophecy. And at the end of time, there will be a fulfillment of the exact same scenario just in a universal setting on a spiritual level. Let's have a look at this. Daniel 11 verse 31. And arms shall stand on his part, because Jesus said we must study the book of Daniel. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Now the sanctuary of course stands for the plan of salvation. How the plan of salvation is to unfold where you brought the lamb and where you confessed your sins over the lamb and the lamb was sacrificed and became, as it were, a type of the great sin bearer who would come, Jesus Christ. And then it led you to the laver and then into the holy, where Jesus is the light of the world, where the bread of his presence is there, the bread that we are to take into our lives and into our very thinking, and which is to change us into what we are, into those who follow Christ. 
And then there's also the altar of incense, which shows that Jesus is the mediator. So they will pollute the way of salvation, in other words. And they shall take away the daily sacrifices added. It's written in cursive, so it's not in the original. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. They will put something in the place of the plan of salvation. In Daniel 12, verse 11, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And here is a time prophecy which expands the 1260 day prophecy by 30 days. Take a day for a year. The 1260 years expanded to 1290. The 1260 starts with the setting up of the abomination that causes desolation until it comes to an end. And that was from 538 AD to 1798. But the decree to set it up went out 30 years earlier, so it's 1,290 days. And what was that abomination that causes desolation? Well, let's continue. Mark 13, verse 14. And when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, the, by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not to, let him that readeth understand. And let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, in Matthew 24, verse 15, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, who readeth, let him understand. We need to understand this issue. So in the time of the Jewish nation, the abomination of desolation was, if we look at the parallel text in Luke, the armies of Rome surrounding Jerusalem. Luke 21, 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea, Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. So here was a sign that God in his mercy had given his church. When you see the abomination of desolation, which in this case was pagan Rome surrounding God's people to destroy it and to take its place. It should not happen, but that was going to happen. It was a promise. Then let God's people flee to the mountains. In other words, get out. Get out of the cities. And those that are in the country should not go back into the city. So apply this to our time and to the events surrounding it. So how did this happen? Because when the armies arrived and they surrounded Jeru Jerusalem, there was no way for them to escape. And then for some reason, the armies receded of Rome. And they went back to Rome. And the Jewish zealots inside the city followed them and started killing the Roman soldiers from behind, which infuriated the Roman emperor. So three and a half years later, Titus came back with a mighty Roman army and eventually Rome destroyed the temple. And in that period of three and a half years, the Christians could escape to the mountains and to the solitary places. They escaped to Pella. And not one Christian died in that siege of Jerusalem. Now how does this apply to the time of the end. Now Rome, of course, has been replaced by Papal Rome, which all the reformers referred to as the Antichrist system. Now if there were two sieges of Jerusalem in the beginning, where the pagan standard would be set up in the place of 
the standard of salvation for God, will the same take place at the end of time? And the answer is yes. Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and the system, not the people, the system has changed the plan of salvation. It has set up a pagan standard. It has changed God's word. It has changed the law of God. It removed the second commandment. It moved the solemnity of the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Having removed the second commandment, they had to augment it by splitting the tenth one into two so that they have ten commandments again. And they will make their standard, their mark of obedience and righteousness, their standard. And they will surround spiritual Jerusalem who stick to the law of God and the covenant that God has made. Now, two sieges were what gave the opportunity to God's people in the time of the destruction of Jerusalem to get out. In 1888, there was a movement to introduce a national Sunday law in the United States of America. And Alonzo T. Jones was the one who uh, gave witness before the United States Senate Committee on Education and Labor. And they would have introduced this bill and they would have arrested those that keep God's Sabbath. And in fact, had even commenced in arresting people who were keeping God's Sabbath. But the arguments of Alonzo T. Jones prevailed and the Roman threat departed. Are we living in a time when Rome is mustering her forces for a second time, we have to keep our eyes open. This is not conspiracy, my brothers and sisters. This is the study of the signs of the times. We need to be aware where, of where we stand in the stream of time. Pope Francis, in his Laudato Si encyclical, Care for Our Common Home, has asked for the introduction of Sunday as a day of rest, to give the environment rest and to allow families to come together. This is in violation of God's law, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So the Roman Catholic system is asking the world for legislation to reintroduce Sunday in the place of God's law. So the abomination of desolation is again encroaching. Does it have the power to do this? Pope Francis says that the pandemic, this is now the coronavirus pandemic, is nature's response to human inaction over climate change. That to me is amazing. So it is nature that we are concerned with and not the sovereignty of the God of heaven. Pope Francis says he believes the Chinese coronavirus pandemic is certainly nature's response to humanity's failure to address the partial catastrophes wrought by human-induced climate change. Asked by British journalist Austin Every whether the COVID-19 crisis is an opportunity for an ecological conversion, the pontiff reasserted his belief that humanity has provoked nature by not responding adequately to the climate crisis. Who are the powers that be that he will use to further his agenda? Well, here's an article. Trump warns the US headed for very, very painful two weeks amid the coronavirus pandemic. This is going to be a very painful, a very, very painful two weeks, he told the press conference at the White House. Trump described the pandemic as a plague. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead, he said. Now, 30 days to slow the spread. 
And here are three individuals in the leadership position to make sure that the public complies to this legislation that would be introduced. Now, who are these three individuals? Well, Donald Trump, of course, is the President of the United States. Mike Pence is the Vice President. And there's a third individual there. And uh, let's look at him. He is Anthony Fauci. No doubt Trump will face surprise infectious disease outbreak. Now I want you to look at the date. This is January the 11th, 2017. Anthony S. Fauci, MD, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, said there is no doubt Donald J. Trump will be confronted with a surprise infectious disease outbreak during his presidency. In 2017? Who is this man? Fauci has led the NIAID for more than three decades, advising the past five United States presidents on global health threats from the early days of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s through to the current Zika virus outbreaks. This is the man who swings the scepter when it comes to pandemics and contagious diseases. Now it is fascinating to me that all three of those individuals in that picture, Donald Trump, Mike Pence and Anthony Fauci, are all Jesuit trained individuals. They all attended Jesuit universities and schools. It's interesting that he made this speech in 2017 during a forum on pandemic preparedness at Georgetown University, which is of course the Jesuit Institute. Fauci said the Trump administration will not only be challenged by ongoing global health threats such as the influenza, influenza and HIV, but also a surprise disease outbreak. The history of the last 32 years that I have been the director of the NIAID will tell the next administration that there is no doubt that they will be faced with the challenge their predecessors were faced with. He said, while observers have speculated since the election about how Trump will respond to such challenges, Fauci and other health experts said to Tuesday, that preventing disease pandemics often starts overseas and that a proper response means collaboration between not only the US and other countries but also the public and private health sectors. We will definitely get surprised in the next few years, he said. Now, are these the only people in this forum Dr. Fauci is dedicated to public service and formed at Jesuit High School. This is the Catholic Courier, which boasts about the fact that the people leading the administration in the United States are largely Jesuit trained. Let's have a look at Mike Pence to meet Pope Francis in the Vatican next week. This was in January 2020. And there are some interesting statements that we can glean. Of course, as we have stated in previous lectures, this man also has Jesuit training. No details have been released of the visit. Sam Brownback, ambassador at large for the International Religious Freedom, was present at Tuesday's opening session of the initiative which was described by Ambassador Gingrich as a dialogue designed to promote peace, religious freedom and inter-religious harmony between Christians, Muslims and Jews. It was inspired, she said, by the 2019 document on human fraternity for world peace and living together, a joint statement of Pope Francis on the Grand Imam and the Grand Imam of al Assar in Abu Dhabi that was signed in the United Arab Emirates. Now I find the next one very interesting. Cardinal Miguel Ayuso 
president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, was present at the gathering, according to Gingrich's remarks, and he said, it's fitting that our discussion should take place at the Pontifical Gregorian University, which is of course the flagship Jesuit university. Gingrich said, citing St. John Henry Newman, that a Catholic university should aid in the discernment of truth. Now this is incredible. The Jesuits were created for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is the destruction of Protestantism. There was no crime too base for them to commit. They would do anything in their power, from assassination to whatever means were at their disposal to meet their ends. And they were to rise in public office so that they could take hold of the reins of power so that the Roman Catholic papal system could be reinstated in its former glory of controlling the affairs of humanity. It's interesting that he refers to a Jesuit university and to John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman, of course, was the so-called Protestant that led the Oxford movement. And it is largely because of him that Protestantism in England was destroyed and watered down to what it is today. There is no vestige of Protestantism left, left as a consequence of John Henry Newman. And this apostate Protestant was then honored by being taken up into the Roman Catholic system where he became a cardinal. And for his great work of destroying Protestantism in England, he was declared a saint. And the previous Pope, Ratzinger, or Pope Benedict, had him dug up and had his moldy bones in his hand disseminated all over the world to be venerated. Where have we come to that the moldy bones of apostate Protestants should be venerated? This is such an affront to Protestantism that it's unbelievable. But it doesn't stop there. If we look at the Committee on the Judiciary, and we're reading there from the Catholic News Agency, President Donald Trump's nominee for Attorney General William Barr said Tuesday that he does not think his Catholic faith is an impediment to leading the Department of Justice. Barr, a practicing Catholic and a member of the Knights of Columbus, was asked by Senator John Kennedy if he were Catholic and what this meant. You're a Roman Catholic, are you not? Asked Kennedy after Barr confirmed that he was. Kennedy then asked him if he thought that this disqualified him from having a position in the US government. Some of my colleagues might think it might, Kennedy added. Barr replied that if he were the Attorney General, he would render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Did they study the oath of the Knights of Columbus, which is not too dissimilar from the oath of the Jesuits. This is amazing. One of the first things he did was to reinstate the death penalty. And the Bible tells us that the second beast of the United States of America will make use of the death penalty when it comes to transgressing their legislation around the mark of the beast. And we've had a discussion on that. And the mark of the beast, Roman Catholicism was identified by Protestantism as the beast, and they clearly state that the mark of their ecclesiastical power is that they transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath to the Sunday. Now my question is, if we see Jesuit trained people in positions of leadership, if we see the Attorney General being a Knight of Columbus, if we see the rest of the administration and even the opposition being very staunch Roman Catholics, and if we go further, religion unplugged, Justice Brett Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court's Catholic majority, here's another Jesuit trained individual, even the Supreme Court is run by Roman Catholic 
judges at the moment. Are we seeing a second siege? And should we be quiet? Should we, because of ecumenical relationships, keep silent and the world go unwarned? You knew about these things, people will say to us, and you never told us. Let us not be dumb dogs that cannot bark. So what are the signs of the end of the age? And where are we standing in the streams of time? Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We all know these verses. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, ethnos against ethnos, which means there will be ethnic tension. There will be racial divide. We see it all over the world. God's people should be as far removed from racism as the East is from the West. God has given us a commission to reach every tribe and people and nation in the world. In God there is no prejudice. Because by one blood he has created all people, says the scripture. Kingdom against kingdom. So there will be national conflicts. We have them all over the world. There will be famines. There will be pestilences. There will be earthquakes. We are seeing all of these things. I'm not going to give a lecture on the signs of the times. This is common knowledge by now. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And then the final issue will be, they will deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. That was a then time prediction and the end time prediction. This second siege of Rome will eventually attempt to destroy the last vestiges of Protestantism on this earth. And what is Protestantism? What is a fundamentalist Protestant? It's one who believes every word that is written in the word of God. And one who believes that the precepts of God are binding to this very day. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It's not just the coronavirus that is a scourge in the world today. Today we have massive locust plagues which are going to destroy the food chain in Africa. And already the hum of millions of locusts on the move is broken by the screams of farmers and the clanging of pots and pans. But their efforts seem to be in vain. And they're expecting more waves of these locusts. There will be famine. We can expect it. This is not fear-mongering. This is a prediction. And it's interesting that Voltaire Net asks, what are 30,000 soldiers doing in Europe without masks? What is this deployment? of a huge military force supposedly for exercises. Why are all these things happening? Why is the military deployed everywhere just to assist but also to control? What have they said in my own country? Didn't they say that they will rule with an iron fist and will not tolerate any dissent? This is not just to distribute masks. So besides the signs of the times, are there any indications as to how close we are to the end? Well, let us venture onto this ground. And uh, it's not an easy decision to venture onto this ground, but if we stick to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and do not go down the road of time setting, then perhaps we should discuss this issue. And the problem is that so many lectures have appeared on the internet 
giving times and dates and events as they will be supposedly happening in the world. And I want to just briefly discuss some of these. So there are a number of ways in which people are trying to calculate where we are standing in the stream of time. And some adopt the apotelismatic principle. Now that is a strange word, so let me try and explain it. One of the people who actually used this apotelismatic principle was Desmond Ford. And we know, of course, that that was highly problematic. This principle affirms that a prophecy fulfilled or fulfilled in part or unfulfilled at the appointed time may have a later recurring or consummated fulfillment. This is what he wrote on the Day of Atonement and Investigative Judgment in Glacier View, Manuscript, 1980, page 485. So this idea says that the prophecies that are in the Bible have more than one application and can be, well, in the future have a different application. Now firstly I would like to state that this principle is based on Greek philosophy and there is no internal consistency with reference to the Bible. It would place Bible prophecy on a par with Nostradamus and mingle futurism with the biblical historic continuous method that Jesus himself used. Now the way to interpret Bi Bible prophecy is to let the Bible speak for itself. And if you go to the book of Daniel, there is a historic thread running through the book of Daniel, a continuous historic fulfillment throughout the prophecy. This is the historic continuous method and this is the biblical method. Any other method puts us on dangerous ground. Let's see how Jesus used it. Jesus himself used the historicist method to interpret Daniel when he announced, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Mark 1.15 this verse alludes to the prophetic fulfillment of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 that predicts the appearance of the Messiah. There is a prophecy that has a time frame and then states when the Messiah would come. And that prophecy, if you calculate it out, comes to the year 27 AD which is the exact year when Jesus commenced his ministry. He was 30 years old, but our calendar is wrong, and any children's encyclopedia will tell you that. So that the time when he was 30 years old was actually 27 AD. So we cannot use that method, this apotelismatic principle, because how would you apply it? How would you, for example, take the images of Daniel chapter 7, which are historic continuous and tell us how the kingdoms will arise. The first is like unto a lion, Babylon. The second like unto a bear, which is Medo-Persia. The third like unto a leopard with four wings and four heads. That was the Greek Empire, and then the terrible beast, which was Rome, and then the ten horns, the European powers that would come out of that system. That is a historic continuous flow. If you wanted to take that prophecy and apply it into the, to the future, then you would have to use those images and appoint other issues to those images. So you could, for example, say, well, the lion is the symbol of England today, so it must be referring to England. And uh, the eagle would be a symbol of the United States of America, because that is their symbol. And the bear, you could make a symbol of Russia, and then you could come up with whatever you wanted to put into it. That's how you use the prophecies of Nostradamus. You fit anything into it, and you have no basis other than conjecture. It is dangerous and we shouldn't go there. The second principle that people use 
to make time prophecies are some adopt the Jubilee principle of calculating the precise time of the end. And they count the Jubilees from the time of Adam all the way to our current time. And there have been some lectures in this regard. And some people believe that the coming of Christ is imminent, maybe in the next year or so, depending on how the Jubilees work out. And they take the issues of exactly when the Pope spoke in, uh, the, to the two houses uh, in the United States of America, and they come to those conclusions. Again, how exactly do you determine it? And the issue becomes so complicated that in the end, you, you really struggle to follow the lines of reasoning. Now, it's very important that we study the verse which says that no one knows that day and the hour. Let's have a look at that verse. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, that's fascinating. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as the thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So Paul is saying that God's people should not be surprised because they should be studying the scriptures and knowing the time. So let us look at this verse in Matthew again. Matthew 24 verse 36. But the day and the hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So, not even Jesus knows the time? Now, in 1865, James White wrote a booklet entitled The Second Advent. And the code for that book is S-E-A-D-V, Second Advent, obviously. And he has a very interesting study around this verse. Let us read what he writes. Many hastily conclude from this text that nothing whatever may be ascertained relative to the period of the second advent. But in taking this position they greatly err, in that they make this class of texts prove too much, even for their unbelief, and which at the same time raise these declarations against others uttered by the Saviour the most plain and pointed. We object to this position. So when asked about the signs of the times, Jesus gave an abundant answer in order to explain the circumstances around his coming. So how is it that we can interpret this text? Can anything be learned from the Bible relative to the period of the second advent? Is a question unsettled in many minds? This is a grave inquiry and from the nature of the subject is worthy of close investigation and candid answer. How did Christ himself treat the subject? When the disciples inquired, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, he did not reprove them for prying into that which was purposely hidden from all men. After all, when we go back in history, when the destruction of the world came in Noah's day, didn't Noah tell them exactly what was going to happen? Wasn't even the time predicted, 120 years? No, he answered them in the most definite manner. He even states that there should be signs of that events and adds, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. The simple fact that the Lord mentions signs of his second advent 
is the best proof possible that his people were not to remain ignorant of the relative nearness of the event. And to this evidence, his declaration that when these signs should be seen, his people should know that it was near, even at the doors, and the case becomes an exceedingly strong one. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, he continues. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. If the text proves that men will know nothing of the period of the second advent, then it also proves that angels will know nothing of it, and also that the Son will know nothing of it. Till the event takes place, this position proves too much. And I agree with him, because if Jesus is one with the Father, and is fully God, then he must know the time. So let's see how he resolves this. So till the event takes place, this position proves too much, therefore proves nothing to the point. Christ will know of the period of his second advent to this world. The holy angels who wait around the throne of heaven to receive messages relative to the part they act in the salvation of men will know of the time of the closing events of salvation, and so will the waiting, watching people of God understand. Now, is he being presumptuous? Let's continue. An old English version of the passage reads, But that day and hour no man maketh known, neither the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. This is the correct reading according to several of the ablest critics of the age. The word know is used in the same sense here that it is by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. For I determined not to know, can be read, make known, anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Men will not make known the day and the hour. Angels will not make it known. Neither will the Son, but the Father will make it known. There's a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy where in early writings she says, as the people of God looked up and waited for the coming of Christ, the time was made known by the voice in heaven, the Father making the time known. So we do not know the day or the hour. He continues and says, says Campbell, McKnight argues that the term know is here used as a causative. In the Hebrew sense of the conjugation, he feel that is to make known. His, Christ's answer, is just equivalent to saying, the Father will make it known when it pleases him, but he has not authorized man, angel, nor the Son to make it known. Just in this sense, Paul uses the term no. In Corinthians 2.2, 2, I came to, to you making known the testimony of God, for I determined to make known nothing amongst you but a crucified Christ. Albert Barnes in his notes on the gospel says, others have said that the verb rendered knoweth means sometimes to make known or to reveal and that the passage means that day and hour none maketh known, neither the angels nor the Son, but the Father. It is true the world has sometimes the word has sometimes that meaning, as in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. That makes a lot of sense. Because how would it be possible that he who is very God and had no beginning, Jesus Christ, would not know the hour? of his coming. Now I'm going to venture onto a ground that is highly problematic. But if we stick closely to the spirit of prophecy, is there anything that we can glean from this? And this is the concept of the great cosmic week. In other words, six days 
which become then a day for a thousand years, six thousand years plus one thousand years for the millennium. Now this is a, a concept that has been around for a very, very long, long time. And we find in Psalms 90 and in 2 Peter the following statement. Psalms 90 verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. 2 Peter 3 verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The book of Revelation refers to the thousand-year millennium period six times. Let's look at one of those verses. Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there are six statements regarding this thousand year period. Some of them talk about the devil that was bound a thousand years. Now, Robert Johnston, the chair of the New Testament Department at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary of Andrews University, wrote an article on the subject, which can be found at this web page. And in this article, he shows that some of the early Advent pioneers, most notably Jane Andrews, were actually firm believers in this principle but that this idea was later discarded by some, including Uriah Smith. It's interesting that as late as 1899, Adventist publications stated firmly that the end would be sometime around the year 1900. This belief that the end will come sometime during a somewhat extended period with an end point can be called soft time setting, as contrasted with the setting of a definite firm date, hard time setting. So this is the theology, and this theology, although it was used by the early pioneers, was basically discarded and has, uh, well, received some very poor press, and people have shied away from it. Now my question is, does the spirit of prophecy throw any light on the subject? In other words, I know that Jay and Andrews believed it, but does the spirit of prophecy throw any light on the subject? And we will look at some of these, and this is not time setting. I'm not time setting at all. I'm just looking at what does the spirit of prophecy say. And I'm not talking about the time or the hour. And I'm not interested in any prophetic interpretation where we take the prophetic times of Daniel, for example, and make them literal times in our dates. That is a system of futurism which is not in harmony with the Bible. We're looking at this cosmic time. And I want to know what does the spirit of prophecy say. There are in fact 42 74 if you count the compilations, 6,000 year statements, and 41 4,000 year statements in her writings. Now, how did I get interested in this? My interest in these statements comes from a, my study of creation versus evolution, particularly with regard to the age of the earth. However, it was proposed by some scholars that these times are not definitive and simply meant, in other words, these 42 or 74 statements on 6,000 and the 41 on 4,000 years, that they were not meant definitively and that they actually meant since the beginning, during Old Testament times. But at least one of these was definitive when she stated, the world is now only about 6,000 years old. That's in three spiritual gifts, 
nine, page 92. Now, Ellen White uses the phrases about 6,000 years 13 times. She uses the statement almost 6,000 years once, and she uses the statement nearly 6,000 years 12 times. But there are three where she states more than 6,000 or over 6,000. And the rest of the statements just say for 6,000 years. Now, I was part of a delegation uh, in the church where we discussed this issue of creation. And I attended a lecture by our some of our prominent theologians, where this whole issue was discussed. And it was stated, quite categorically, that none of these statements on the 6,000 years can be used to determine the age of the earth. Now, I'd just come into this church, and I'd been an evolutionist, and my whole world was turned upside down, as a consequence of the study of the prophecies, and then eventually also a study of our origins and evolution, which of course entailed the age of the earth. And as I listened to these lectures, which by the way are also written in journals, these same sentiments, I was confronted with this idea that there are many statements which say that the earth is about 6,000 years old, or almost 6,000 years old, or nearly 6,000 years old. But there are these three statements which state more than 6,000. And therefore this was presented as proof that you cannot take them as definitive. Now, this concerned me. And moreover, it was stated in those publications and in those lectures that where these statements are made about the 6,000 years, it's probable that she was influenced by the margin of the King James Version, which contained Usher's dates, and therefore in the concept of the stream of time or the time period where they were living, it was logical for her to just adopt these statements of 6,000 years. And it bothered me. So I put up my hand in that meeting and I said, now, I just have one problem. And this is the problem. If she was influenced by the margin of the King James Version to say that it was 6,000 years, then what else could have influenced her in terms of all our other statements in the spirit of prophecy? Can we then still trust the spirit of prophecy as an inspired source? Or shall we just lay it aside? Well, there was another document which was then uh, discussed and the issue was explained as followed. Yes, we believe that she was inspired but that she didn't have the same authority as the other prophets. She was as inspired, but didn't have the same authority. Now, that's an oxymoron. How can you be inspired and not have the same authority? Does God speak through inspiration with authority only through some people and with no authority through other people? Was this exegetical or was this homiletical? That was the question. Well, it bothered me because it disturbed my apple cart when it came to the age of the earth. I wasn't thinking at all about what we are discussing today. It was at that time just the age of the earth. And so when I came back to my home in South Africa and went back to my university, and started working on my lectures on evolution and creation, this thought bothered me. And I prayed and I said, Lord, this makes no sense to me. How can it be almost 
or about 6,000 in one place and more than 6,000 in another. If there is anything wrong with this, then you must show me, because else I will have to discard virtually everything she wrote. Because if she's influenced by every wind of doctrine out there, then how can I trust the spirit of prophecy? And I filed it in file 13 and left it. And a few years later, a coal porter gave me a little pile of pamphlets. And I read them and I went through them and suddenly I almost fell off my chair because there was one particular pamphlet that caught my attention. But before I get there, here's one statement that I find interesting from the biographies. In other words, this is not Ellen G. White writing because it was stated that Ellen White never ever received any visions regarding the time that uh, this controversy or the age of the earth was concerned. But here in the biographical volumes, 1 bio 366, we read the following. The vision of Lavette's Grove, Ohio, on a Sunday afternoon in mid-March 1858, was one of great importance. In this, the theme of the great controversy between Christ and his angels on the one side and Satan and his angels on the other was seen as one continuous and closely linked chain of events spanning 6,000 years. So in other words, the great controversy vision actually had this time frame. It's interesting, this vision has put Seventh-day Adventists in a unique position with clear-cut views of the working of providence in the history of our world. A viewpoint quite different from that held by secular historians who see events of history as the interplay between the actions of men, often seemingly the result of chance or natural developments. In other words, this vision and others of the great conflict of the ages yield a philosophy of history that answers many questions in prophetic forecast, gives the assurance of the final victory of good over evil. So it was very definitive. So I would like to look at some of these statements. And what was this pamphlet that I had received? What about the more than or over 6,000 years? Well, this pamphlet had the following information. Warren H. Johns, the seminary librarian at Andrews University, researched this issue and he came to the conclusion that Ellen White believed that there were exactly 4,000 years between the creation of man and the birth of Christ. And that her consistent position was that the world was less than 6,000 years old. Warren H. Johns, Ellen G. White and Biblical Chronology, Ministry, April 1984, pages 20 to 22. Now personally, I do not quite agree with his statement over here and uh, we'll talk about why in a moment. Because he takes it to the birth of Christ and I believe that is not the correct way in which she used it. But be that as it may, she clearly believed the 4,000 and the 6,000. Now what about those three statements? Well, the first one is found in Historical Sketches, page 133. More than 6,000 years of continual practice, referring to the devil's arts. This statement does not deal with the age of the earth or the time since the fall, but with how long the devil has been in the deception business. And of course, deception started in heaven, which could have been hundreds of years for all we know. So it has nothing to do with the age of the earth. It has to do with how long the devil has been in the deception business. And after all, he deceived a third of the angels. So that takes care of that one statement. The second statement is from the story of Jesus and it says, and for more than 6,000 years, 
In its forms of beauty and gifts of sustenance, the earth has borne witness of the Creator's love. Now that sounds like it could be problematic, but if you study it, this statement comes from the chapter, The Home of the Saved, and deals with the new earth, when the earth will be about 7,000 years old, so it has nothing to do with the 6,000 years period of sin. Now the third statement is the most problematic. This statement comes from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 154, and states, the, the continual transgression of man for over 6,000 years. Now in 1977, Dr. Robert Gentry of Earth Science Associates contacted the White Estate regarding this statement and was told that this was a copying error and that the original first source from which it was taken was Three Testimonies, page 491, 492, and did not contain the word over. Moreover, Ellen White did not use the word over when she used the earlier material to write the book Desire of Ages. So, in other words, the three statements do not negate Ellen White's stand that the earth is almost 6,000 years old. Now let's have a look and see exactly what the spirit of prophecy says. And again I reiterate, I'm not time setting. I'm studying the spirit of prophecy. I want to know what the prophet said. I don't want to know what a theologian thinks the prophet thought or what influenced the prophet. I want to know what did she say. So let's ask the question, according to the spirit of prophecy, how long will sin reign? Well here is a statement, after 6,000 years of sin the earth was renewed. The great plan of redemption, this comes from Adventist home, results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now I want to come back to this statement at a later stage. But the point for discussion right here is that she definitively states that for 6,000 years Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. That is a very direct statement. So my question now is, where, according to the spirit of prophecy, are we in the stream of time? So when, according to the spirit of prophecy, will 6,000 years have elapsed since the fall of man? Well, let's start with the 4,000 year statements. At Christ's baptism, sin had reigned, according to the spirit of prophecy, 4,000 years. And that was in 27 AD. Let's make sure. Because there are so many of these talks out there which give dates, either calculating as we saw from the birth of Christ or from the crucifixion or from any time period in between. I want to know exactly. I don't want to know about what does she say. So let's be careful in the way we approach it. Christ in the wilderness of temptation. Let's just stop there. What year was that? Christ entered the wilderness of temptation directly after his baptism, and that was in 27 AD. Let's make sure. Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf. 
4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. So since the fall of Adam to the temptation in the wilderness, which took place in 27 AD, is the time period since the fall of Adam. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been departing each successive generation further from the original purity, wisdom and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. Christ bore the sins and the infirmities of the race as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. In behalf of the race, with the weaknesses of fallen man upon him, he was to stand the temptation of Satan upon all points on which man could be assailed. So exactly 4,000 years since the fall of Adam to the wilderness of temptation. Let's read another one. The Savior of the world has no controversy with Satan, who was expelled from heaven because he was no longer worthy of a place there. He who could influence the angels of God against their supreme ruler, against his son, their loved commander, and enlist their sympathy for himself was capable of any deception. For 4,000 years he had been warring against the government of God and had lost none of his skills or power to tempt and deceive. Again, here Satan was going to confront Jesus in the wilderness of temptation and he had 4,000 years to contemplate how he was overcome Jesus as he had overcome Adam. Let's make sure on Jordan's banks the voice from heaven attended by the manifestation from the excellent glory proclaimed Christ to be the Son of the Eternal. That is the baptism of Jesus where the voice from heaven came and said this is my beloved Son. So we have a date. It was 27 AD. Satan was to personally encounter the head of the kingdom which he came to overthrow. If he failed, he knew that he was lost. Therefore the power of his temptation was in accordance with the greatness of the object which he would lose or gain for 4,000 years. Now listen carefully. Ever since the declaration was made to Adam that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, he had been planning his manner of attack. We have precise times in this statement. From the fall of Adam up into the wilderness experience of Jesus. Exactly 4,000 years. In other words, until the baptism. Let us go to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians 4 verse 4 and 5. When the fullness of time had come. We need to know what that is. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. In other words, that promise that now had taken 4,000 years of time to be fulfilled. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer, but the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Those who first received it died without the sight. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent. So the prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent from the time that the promise was made that he would crush the serpent's head. But not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away, the voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel and many were ready to exclaim, The days are prolonged and every vision faileth. Ezekiel 12 verse 22. So what were the conditions prevailing at the first coming of Christ? So we know a time now, exactly 4,000 years since the fall of Adam, according to the spirit of prophecy. Please note, 
not according to me, according to the spirit of prophecy, exactly 4,000 years, to the baptism of Christ. Now, what were the conditions? When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Providence had directed the movements of nations. Do you not think that God will direct through providence the movement of nations in our time? And the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. The nations were united under one government. That's an important point. It was the Roman system. One language was widely spoken and was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feasts. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. So let's project to our time. The nations were united under one government. Not yet the case. One language was widely spoken, English in our time. And the Jews were dispersed through all nations. God has his people dispersed through all the nations. We have many of these conditions. Genesis 11 verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. This is the Tower of Babel, where humanity was united as one which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So this attempt to unify, God had interrupted. In the time when Jesus came, there was almost one nation ruling everywhere, and in the second coming, it could be the same. Well, let's have a look at this statement. And this is the Handelsblatt in Germany, and it's fascinating that they show the EU as the Tower of Babel with the waters rushing around it with the coronavirus catastrophe. And here in the corner it says, Wir brauchen eine globale Führung. We need a global leadership. We need to become one. We are building a Tower of Babel. Here they decided to build a city. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 118. And in it a tower of such stupendous height as should render it the wonder of the world. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. One king, one moral leader. Do we have such a figure where everybody flocks to him in Rome for moral guidance in the time that we are living in? Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generation. Well, here is Yuval Noah Harari, a very famous author, and he said, we will have a totally different world after the coronavirus. And in this fight against the pandemic, we need one world leadership. Catholic Herod, Herald, God's plan is to unite all humanity, says the Pope. So the Pope is calling for this unity. Here is the Catholic press and it says the Pope wants all people to be united because of the corona pandemic. These are important signs which are leading up to exactly the conditions 
that the Bible describes at the first coming of Christ. Here is Gordon Brown, one of the former Prime Ministers of England. He calls for a global government to tackle coronavirus. The former Labour Prime Minister who was at the centre of the international effort to tackle the impact of the near meltdown of the banks in 2008 says we need a global governance. Is it only him? No. Angela Merkel asks for a new world order. These are the headlines that are screaming at us. Kissinger says even the US can't defeat COVID-19 alone. His solution? Global New World Government, of course. We need a new world always, always preaching about this. The man is 96 years old and he's still preaching his New World Order. And the world will be different after coronavirus and we will have the conditions that prevailed before. It might look different. I'm not interested in exactly what this new order will look like. George Bush Sr. said, no nation will give up one iota of its sovereignty, but the communication and the way in which things will work will be different. Obama drops coronavirus bombshell. It's all due to climate change. And he's the one that supported the Pope when he came to give his speech. He is the one that made this issue prominent. And it's interesting that Erdogan said that he has a pact with Putin and that Trump and Putin and him as a leader of the Middle East, they will create a new order. What that order looks like doesn't matter. We're looking at signs of the times. One of the great signs before the end is that Satan must impersonate Christ before the coming of the Lord. Matthew 24 verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And 2 Corinthians 11 14, And no marvel, marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. A power working from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. When I read this and I hear all these people talk about conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories, we're not dealing with conspiracy theories, we are dealing with prophetic fulfillment. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Saviour's advent at the consumption of our hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself amongst men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. This is a future prediction. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come! Christ has come! The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. This comes from the great controversy. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon earth, his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Saviour uttered. He heals the diseases of the people and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. So in other words, the issue of papal legislation must already have been discussed when this appearance takes place. How close are we to this appearance? Well, isn't it fascinating? 
that the Israeli rabbi says he's already holding meetings with the Messiah, and this is from February the 20th, 2020, this year. Rab rabbi Yaakov Zicholz on Sunday told religious broadcaster Radio 2000 that Rabbi Kaim Kanivsky recently told him that he, Kanivsky, is already in direct contact with the Messiah. To understand why religious Jews are taking this seriously, it's important to know that Rabbi Kaim Kanivsky is considered one of the two or three top rad rabbis of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Israel. And Rabbi Zichold says that Kanivsky and others of the mystical concealed rabbis have now tasked him with informing the public of the Messiah's imminent arrival. Rabbi Zicholz began his explosive three-hour interview with a warning. The process of redemption is about to start happening, very quickly and at a fast pace. The last events shall be rapid ones. It is important that people remain calm and steady to act properly in the right time. There is a potential Messiah in every generation and there are righteous men who know precisely who it is. This is of course true in this generation. Getting the word out now that the Messiah is closer than ever is a matter of life and death. Haven't you heard of Gog and Magog? That is what's going to happen very soon. Right now the situation is explosive more than you can possibly imagine. Everyone needs to know whether they are on the inside or they're going to be left out. And then he went on to reiterate that a certain Rabbi Dom Cook, as everybody knows, is a righteous man. He is one of the greatest men of our generation. Ten years ago, when Israel was suffering from horrible drought, someone asked Rabbi Cook when the Sea of Galilee will be full. Recounted Rabbi Zicholz. Rabbi Cook responded that when the Messiah arrives, the Sea of Galilee will be full. In a few weeks, the Sea of Galilee will be full for the first time since Rabbi Cook made this statement. Then I also proclaimed that Netanyahu will be the final president. Now, I'm not using this as time setting. I'm using this as background information that the conditions described in the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy are ripe. They are there for us to perceive. I do not for one moment believe in the Israel vision. I'm just looking at the signs which we are informed to do and trying to bring a message. So my question is this. If Christ came at exactly 4,000 years after Adam sinned, and if we add 2,000 years, could the world end in 2027 according to this calculation? Because remember, Christ came 27 AD when 4,000 years since the fall of Adam had expired. And add to that the 2,000 years to make the 6,000 would bring us to the year 2027. But before I go there, and remember I am not time-setting, I'm merely quoting the spirit of prophecy. I want to look at that statement that I referred to earlier. And I said we would come back to it. Let's look at it carefully. It's the statement about after 6,000 years of sin, the earth was renewed. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan had struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now, God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever, even forever and ever. What is the context of this statement? Well, it is the, in the context of the final restoration, when the saints will possess this kingdom and the earth forever and ever. 
So it is after the millennium when the earth will be restored to its original. But even after the millennium, the time period that Satan had been warring against this government was 6,000 years. For 6,000 years, Satan had struggled to maintain possession of the earth. So it's the time frame of his total struggle. Now remember, during the millennium, he cannot struggle. He's bound for a thousand years. He is inactivated. He has no power to do anything. So how do we understand this? Let us look at Satan preparing for the final battle. This is me writing. So when the wicked are raised, Satan must have some time to prepare them for battle. If 2027 is the end of the 6,000 year period of warring against God, then this would exclude the time of preparation required after the wicked are raised. Is it possible, I'm just asking the question, that a time could be cut off from the 6,000 years before 2027? If so, then Christ must come sometime before 2027 to allow this, if we take the prophecies in the spirit of prophecy as definitive in terms of time. Now Romans 9 verse 28 says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. So there will be a time when he will cut it short. Here's another statement in the spirit of prophecy. Those who are not interested in the cause of God on earth can never sing the song of redeeming love above. I saw that the quick work that God was doing on the earth would soon be cut short in righteousness and that the messengers must speed swiftly on their way to search out the scattered flock. We have a work to do. I want to remind you again, this is not time setting, but let the Bible and the spirit of prophecy speak for themselves. Revelation 20 verse 3 says about the devil and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So here is a thousand years of rest, complete. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So after the thousand years, there is a little season when he will be active again. But by the time you get to the restoration of the earth, Satan will have been active for exactly 6,000 years, according to that previous statement. So now what about this little season? And when the thousand years are expired, 20 verse 7, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he can again commence to deceive the nations. That's the biblical version. Now let's go to the spirit of prophecy. This is now after the thousand years. The city of God has come down onto this earth. A plain has been created where Jesus' feet land on the Mount of Olives, and the city comes down on this purified area. What happens then? Then Jesus and all the retinue of holy angels and all the redeemed saints left the city. The angels surrounded their commander and escorted him on his way, and the train of redeemed saints followed. Then in terrible, fearful majesty, Jesus called forth the wicked dead. And they came up with the same feeble, sickly bodies that went into the grave. What a spectacle, what a scene. At the first resurrection all came forth in immortal bloom, but at the second the marks of the cursed are visible on all. This is exactly in accordance with the Bible description of the second resurrection. The kings and noblemen of the earth, the mean and the low, the learned and the unlearned came forth together. All behold the Son of Man. And those very men who despised and mocked him, who put the crown of thorns upon his sacred brow, 
and smote him with a reed, behold him in all his kingly majesty. Those who spit upon him in the hour of his trial now turn from his piercing gaze and from the glory of his countenance. Those who drove the nails through his hands and feet now look upon the marks of his crucifixion. Those who thrust the spear into his side behold the marks of their cruelty on his body and they know that he is the very one whom they crucified and derided in, the, in his expiring agony. And then there arises one long protected wail of agony and they flee to hide from the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All are seeking to hide in the rocks to shield themselves from the terrible glory of him whom they once despised. And overwhelmed and pained with his majesty and exceeding glory, they with one accord raise their voices with terrible distinctness exclaim, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now what happens next? Then Jesus and the holy angels, accompanied by all the saints, went again to the city. And the bitter lamentations and wailings of the doomed wicked filled the air. Then I saw that Satan again commenced his work. So here is a time again where he's going to try and wrest the government of God from him. And that period that he was warring against God is exactly 6,000 years, according to that previous statement. He passed around amongst his subjects and made the weak and feeble strong and told them that he and his angels were powerful. He pointed to the countless millions who had been raised. There were mighty warriors and kings who were skill, well skilled in battle, who had conquered kingdoms. And there were mighty giants and valiant men who had never lost a battle. There was the proud, ambitious Napoleon whose approach had caused the kingdoms to tremble. There stood men of lofty statue and dignified bearing who had fallen in battle while thirsting to conquer. As they came forth from their graves, they resumed the current of their thoughts where it ceased in death. They possessed the same desire to conquer which ruled when they fell. Satan consults with his angels and then with those kings and conquerors and mighty men. Then he looks over the vast army and tells them that the company in the city is small and feeble and that they can go up and take it and cast out its inhabitants and possess his riches and glory themselves. Satan succeeds in deceiving them and all immediately begin to prepare themselves for battle. There are many skillful men in that vast army and they construct all kinds of implements of war. That takes time. What kind of weapons will they construct? Will they construct swords? Or are there men of genius who might construct even nuclear weapons to try and take on this enemy? Then with Satan at the head, the multitude move on. Kings and warriors follow close after Satan and the multitude follow after in companies. Each company has its leader and order is observed as they march over the broken surface of the earth to the holy city. My question is how long does it take him to organize this vast army, to put it into companies, to appoint the leaders, to construct the weapons of war that will be necessary for such a cosmic battle. Jesus closes the gates of the city and this vast army surrounded and place themselves in battle array expecting a fierce conflict. You know, if we go to Jesuit theater, which is Hollywood, then we'll see that there have been many, many movies about an earth totally destroyed and how they then create all the weapons and manufacture all the things necessary for this great final battle, where in the movies they always succeed. But in this biblical story, the tables are turned. Jesus and all his angelic host and all the saints with the glittering crowns upon their heads ascend to the top of the wall of the city. And Jesus speaks with majesty, saying, Behold, ye sinners, and reward of the just, and behold, my redeemed, the reward of the wicked. 
The vast multitude behold the glorious company on the walls of the city, and as they witness the splendor of their glittering crowns and see their faces radiant with glory reflecting the image of Jesus, and then behold the unsurpassed glory and majesty of the King of kings and Lord of lords, their courage fails. A sense of the treasure and glory which they have lost rushes upon them, and they realize that the wages of sin is death. They see the holy happy company whom they have despised, clothed with glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life, while they are outside of the city with every mean and abominable thing. And then the Bible says, And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. 6,000 years. If it takes time to prepare this army, how long does it take? I don't know. I'm not going to make a time. So if we are now in 2020, and the 6,000 years would end in 2027, if we take them as a continuous period. And according to the spirit of prophecy, the 6,000 year period would come to an end in 2027. But a time period is cut off and added on to this portion of time when he prepares his army. Then how much time will be cut off? I don't know. Would one year be enough to organize such a vast army, to build weapons of war, to keep people alive and all the things that are necessary? Surely this takes time of preparation as they watch the city and prepare. Is it two years, three years, four years, five years? I don't know. But whatever it is, it means we are, according to the spirit of prophecy in that final week, and if that time is cut off, then Jesus must come in the next few years. And therefore the time is short. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying when he's coming. I'm saying it's time is short. Matthew 24 verse 48 says, But, and if that evil servant, and this servant is someone that serves in God's church, shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. In other words, when they will say, this is not it, this is not the beginning of sorrows. No, we still have time. Jesus won't come for another 100 years, 200 years. I've heard it from so many people. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. In other words, if they start attacking those people who say that the time is short, while they are eating and drinking with those who are drunk from the wine of Babylon, perhaps they're sitting in ecumenical councils discussing these issues and talking about the fanatics out there who are saying that the time is short and who are watching the signs of the times. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've not made a time, brothers and sisters. I've just looked at what the spirit of prophecy says. And if those statements are inspired, and not just influences, from whatever source out there, then we have very little time left. Now, the Lord can add to that time. The Lord delays his coming. coming. The Lord can take away from that time. I don't know. I'm not making a time. I'm saying that the time is short. And if a por portion of time is cut off for preparation there at the end, after the millennium, then the time is even shorter. I believe we are in the closing hours of this earth's history. And we will see a new world emerge out of this coronavirus. Maybe there will be that time of peace. And then again, that repetition of turmoil that we read about. Maybe that will take place. I don't know. Matthew 24 verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, 
Take heed that no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you by telling you that the coming of the Lord is not for many years to come. It's not in accordance with the signs of the times in which we are living. I can see the forces of Rome mustering their powers in the, in the echelons of power out there in governments. And I can see the implementation of the directives of the man of sin. He is calling for all to come and be educated on the subject. And I believe we are very close to the end. If I am proven wrong, then I will be happy because then we'll have more time to preach the gospel. But if these things are so, and if the prophet can be taken at her word, then our time is very limited. Let us preach the three angels' messages. Let us make use of every capacity and ability that God has given us. And maybe he'll give us a window of opportunity. And maybe not. I don't know. But the time is short. Let's get ready for the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if these things are so, then our time is short indeed. And Lord, I pray that you will prepare the hearts of your people, that they may stand, so that they can bring the loud cry and warn the world, just as John the Baptist, a man who was not part of the great educated class, brought the message at your first coming, May thousands of voices throughout the world in every nation, tribe and kingdom stand up and proclaim the soon coming of the Lord and warn the world to make the right choice between the precepts of God and the precepts of man is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.